The first uh, talk will consist of two presentations. Namely, the first about 20 minutes will be given by David Steurer from ETH Zurich at the Institute of Theoretical Computer Science and the second half of the presentation by Prasad Raghavendra from the University of California Computer Science Division in Berkeley. And uh, the joint title of their presentation is here, High Dimensional Estimation via Sum of Square Proofs. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to talk at this uh, venue. So uh, uh, this is the title of our uh, lecture. For more details about uh, uh, about this um, uh, about high-dimensional estimation via some of Square's proofs, um, you can look at our uh, proceedings article with uh, Tzlil Shram. Okay. So um, estimation refers to a class of problems that um, uh, that captures important uh, questions stu studied in uh, uh, different uh, disciplines like uh, signal processing, statistics, and machine learning. And an estimation problem has the following form. We are given uh, the output y of a known randomized process for some unknown input uh, x star. And the goal is to approximately recover this uh, unknown input x star. Okay, um, there are different uh, terminologies for estimation depending on the scientific community. For example, estimation problems are also called uh, in inference or inverse problems. Uh, and uh, the unknown input of the process is uh, also called signal or parameter. The output of the process is also called measurement or observation. Okay, and I'll use these uh, terms uh, interchangeably. Um, an important question that can be framed as an estimation problem is uh, clustering. Um, we're given n data points, y1 up to uh, yn in Rd. Um, and, um, uh, each data point is a random perturbation of one of k unknown centers. Concretely, uh, every data point yi is equal to one of the k centers, xi star, plus uh, a standard Gaussian vector wi. And uh, the goal is to recover for each data point, the, uh, for each data point yi, the corresponding center xi star. Okay, for this estimation problem, um, you know, we only know the, um, the data points and the number of clusters, um, the number of centers, um, but in, in, and in particular, we don't know the, the cluster centers or, or which points belong to the same cluster. Okay? And the goal is to recover for each data point the corresponding center. <coughs> um, and this uh, um, model for clustering is called the Gaussian mixture model. And it's one of the most extensively uh, studied uh, statistical models. Uh, it would be useful for us uh, to have a more uh, concise formulation of this problem. Uh, we start with a d by n matrix x star, whose uh, columns are uh, the vectors this, uh, x, x1 star up to xn star. Um, that means that x star is restricted to have at most k different columns. And then we obtain a matrix y by adding to x star a matrix W um, that, uh, that has independent standard Gaussian entries. And now the clustering problem is uh, just uh, to recover this matrix X star given the matrix Y. <coughs> and uh, other important estimation problems uh, have similar formulations um, where we have different constraints on the, uh, on, on the signal X star. For example, linear regression corresponds to the case that we restrict x star to a known linear subspace. And principal component analysis corresponds to the case that we require x star to be a rank 1 matrix. And uh, we can ob obtain a problem called tensor principal component analysis by, um, restricting, by requiring that x star is a rank 1 uh, tensor. And this uh, problem, tensor principal component analysis, will play a role uh, for this talk. Okay. Um, now, what does it mean to recover x star? Um, so we want an estimator uh, x, x hat that uh, outputs as a function of y a matrix that is close to x star, let's say in Frobenius norm. And this um, error should be small with high probability over the noise w, no matter what uh, signal x star we, we had. Now, what are the theoretical guarantees um, that we have for this uh, error? Um, first, there exists an estimator that achieves error log k. Um, 
and this bound is best possible uh, statistically. That means that no estimator whatsoever can have, uh, statist can have statistically an error of uh, lower order. Unfortunately, this, uh, this error that achieves uh, error log k is um, uh, not computationally efficient, and uh, it requires exponential time uh, to compute. And if you want to uh, have a computationally efficient estimator, then until recently, the, um, the best known bound was uh, square root of k. So, so that means that uh, we have here this exponentially large gap between the best error bound for a from a statistical point of view and the best error bound from a computational point of view. And uh, we would like to understand if this uh, gap is inherent or whether they are better, uh, or, or whether we have to look for better estimation algorithms. And we would like to understand this question not just for clustering, but also for other estimation problems, like tensor PCA, where we have a large gap between uh, the statistical error bounds and the computational ones. So next I want to give you an overview of the rest of the talk. So first we will discuss the sum of squares meta algorithm. Uh, that's an efficient uh, algorithm that is not tailored toward any particular problem, but instead applies to a wide range of estimation problems in a nearly canonical way. Um, and we will show that for clustering, this meta-algorithm um, achieves a significantly improved um, uh, uh, error bound, and, and the, this improved uh, error nearly matches the optimal statistical error. And this, um, this result is an example of a, of a broader phenomenon um, that we call the proof to algorithm paradigm. Uh, and third, um, uh, we will show a strong, uh, we show strong uh, limitations for sum of squares for concrete estimation problems like tensor PCA. And these results contribute evidence that for some estimation problems, a, la a large gap between statistical error and computational error is inherent. And what enables these results is a, a remarkable technique uh, called uh, pseudo-calibration due to uh, this work by, uh, by Rack et al. Now let me tell you about this uh, uh, meta-algorithm for estimation problems. So let uh, omega be our set of possible signals. For clustering, omega would consist of matrices that have at most k different columns. For tensor PCA, omega would consist of all uh, rank 1 uh, tensors of order 3. Um, or tensors of order four, I think, uh, in the rest, next talk. Um, um, ah. And um, now, in our estimation problem, we are given uh, a vector y that is equal to one of, our, one of the possible signals x star plus the standard Gaussian vector w. And our goal is to estimate the signal x star from the measurement y. Um, the starting point for this meta-algorithm is that we have to come up with a, a, a system of low-degree polynomial constraints in x and y, and um, um, such that for all um, um, possible signals x star, the following two properties hold with high probability over the measurements y. Okay, the first property is that uh, you know, the signal measurement pair satisfies uh, the polynomial constraints. And the second property is that the um, uh, constraints identify um, our signal x star up to an error of at most epsilon. And what this means is that um, after plugging in the measurement y, uh, every solution to uh, the system of polynomial constraints, these constraints, um, is, uh, should be epsilon close to the signal x star. Um, now, if you have these two, these, together, these two properties together mean that um, we can guess that an estimate um, for x star with error at most epsilon by solving uh, this system of polynomial constraints. Okay, so that's great. Uh, unfortunately, these estimates are um, a priori not uh, efficiently computable. And the reason for that is that, uh, the reason is that um, uh, polynomial constraints are NP hard to solve in general. Now, the classical way to cope with um, uh, this uh, issue of NP-hardness is uh, to develop specialized solvers that exploit the structure of the polynomial constraints that we have for our particular estimation problem. And indeed, many classical estimation problems can be viewed in this way. Unfortunately, uh, these kinds of uh, algorithms are often notoriously hard to analyze, and in most cases, we don't have strong provable guarantees for them. 
And uh, uh, this talk is about an emerging um, alternative approach. And what underlies this approach is uh, a systematic procedure that often allows you to turn a proof of, uh, of this uh, property star into um, an efficient uh, estimation algorithm. And more concretely, um, this uh, Samos Pierce meta algorithm gives an efficiently computable estimator that achieves error at most epsilon for every signal measurement pair that satisfy um, these two, uh, two properties and uh, where the second property has a low degree proof. And that means that in order to show that this estimator is good, um, it is enough to show that, um, most measurements, um, that for most, most measurements these low degree proofs exist. Okay. Now let me tell you what these um, low degree proofs are. So let S be um, the set of solutions to uh, the constraints that the polynomials P1 of X up to PM of X are non-negative. Um, now we consider for some low degree polynomial uh, Q of X, the statement that Q of X is non-negative over the set S. Okay. And uh, we say that this statement has a degree L sum of squares proof if we can express uh, the polynomial Q of X as a sum of um, polynomials of degree at most L that are non-negative over S and have uh, an R of a particular form. And uh, uh, this particular form is that they are a product of a squared, of a squared polynomial R of X squared uh, and um, powers of the constrained polynomials P1 of X up to PM of X. And every polynomial of this form is so negative over the set S, and that means that uh, an expression of Q of X as a sum of such polynomials constitutes a proof that Q of X is indeed non-negative over S. And these proofs enjoy um, remarkable properties. For example, um, under mild compactness uh, conditions, every true statement of this uh, form has a low degree, has a, has a sum of squares proof, but its degree may potentially be very large. Um, and, um, and this fact is closely related to classical facts in mathematics, in particular Hilbert's uh, 17th problem, which is about expressing positive polynomials as sums or squares of rational functions, and the positive Stellensatz from uh, real algebraic uh, geometry. Now, for our purposes, uh, an important property of sum of squares proofs is that even though some statements require a very large degree to proof, many statements that are useful for estimation require only low degree um, to proof. Okay, another uh, key property of these proofs is, is that they are computationally efficient. Uh, given polynomials uh, P1 up to PM and uh, Q, uh, if a low degree proof exists for this statement, um, we can find it efficiently using convex optimization. <coughs> and this fact is uh, what underlies the computational efficiency of the sum of squares meta algorithm that I mentioned before. Now let's see how these things work for uh, clustering. Um, so, first we need to come up with a low degree, uh, with low degree polynomial constraints that our uh, signal measurements pair, signal measurements pair, are, signal measurements pairs are likely to satisfy. Um, and instead of writing down the polynomials explicitly, um, let me just tell you um, the conditions that these polynomial constraints impose on x and y. Um, first, uh, they impose that x has at most k different columns, and this condition makes sense because our signal x star satisfies this condition. And second, um, these conditions, imp uh, the polynomial constraints impose that the matrix Y minus X looks Gaussian. And indeed, if uh, X is equal to X star, then, and, and Y is a measurement, then Y minus X has a, has a Gaussian distribution, and so it makes sense to ask that Y minus X looks like a Gaussian. Um, and concretely, to formalize uh, this, uh, this condition, uh, we consider the uniform distribution over the columns of W, and, 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 and we require that its, low, that its moments up to degree L are, are close to the moments of a standard Gaussian vector. Okay, so those are the conditions uh, imposed on X and Y by the polynomial constraints. And um, we can show that these constraints identify X star up to, um, up to error L times K to the 1 over L, uh, if the sample size is, uh, is large enough, at least D to the L. And furthermore, the proof of, of, of this fact uh, has degree at most L. And now, via this uh, sum of square uh, meta-algorithm, the existence of, of, of these uh, low-degree proofs imply an, um, uh, that we can efficiently compute estimates 
uh, for this clustering problem that have uh, uh, this error. In particular, if we choose now L to be log of K, then uh, the error matches the optimal statistical error at the cost of um, you know, the, running time being, the running time and sample size being quasi-polynomial. Um, and the strategy for proving this theorem is, uh, you know, we, we follow a very general strategy to prove this theorem, and the strategy is to first find a regular proof that the constraints are identifying, and then uh, turn this proof step by step into a low degree one. Okay, and the key ingredient of 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 of, of the proof that the constraints are identifying is the stability of uh, um, of the mean of a Gaussian vector um, um, under restrictions. Okay, and what this means is that. Um, for every, uh, the, so what we mean by this stability is that for every set A, um, if you look at the mean of, 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 the Gaussian, of a Gaussian vector W conditioned on A, uh, the norm of this mean is at most logarithmic in, uh, uh, in the probability of the set A. Okay? Um, and furthermore, um, if you only um, know that the first L moments of the random vector W are Gaussian, then we get a bound uh, of this form that quickly approaches the, the, the bound in the Gaussian case. And finally, uh, the proof of this fact has degree at most 2L, uh, where we think of the indicator function of A as our variable. Okay. Now to end my part of the talk, um, let me summarize this uh, proof to algorithm paradigm um, let me summarize this proof to algorithm paradigm. So we start with an estimation problem that we want to solve. And um, then we, um, the first step is to derive low degree polynomial constraints that the signal, measurements pair, signal measurement pairs are likely to satisfy. And these constraints can be viewed as a concise encoding of the, of the estimation problem that we want to solve. Um, and then uh, the second step is to show that these constraints are, are identifying. And if we carry out these first two steps as a direct consequence, um, it, it, it means that there exists an estimator with error at most epsilon. Unfortunately, this, error, uh, this estimator is likely to be computationally inefficient. Um, and now the third step of this proof to algorithm paradigm is to show that this property is not only true, but it also has a low degree proof. And, and then um, um, after, the, after we carry out the, the third step, um, the sum of squares meta algorithm gives us in a black box way an estimator that also has a, a, a error at most epsilon, but is now efficient. Okay, and um, the general strategy to carry out the third step is, uh, um, you know, to to transform uh, the proof that we found in the second step into a low degree one. And uh, the key advantage here is that uh, this task is modular, and there is a growing set of tools that help you carry out this task. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the second part of the talk, uh, I'll, be, I'll demonstrate how the sum of squares technique has uh, emerged as a possible way, as lens, to study average case complexity. So in order to do that, let me uh, pick an example problem. So here's the example. It's a tensor PCA problem. So in this problem, you are given a four tensor. The four tensor is a four-dimensional array of numbers, but it consists as a sum of two parts. There's an unknown vector x, unknown unit vector x, which is our signal. And we have x tensor 4 plus w, which is random Gaussian noise. And our goal is, given this tensor, recover the signal x. And here, there's a parameter lambda, which controls the ratio of the signal to the noise in the tensor. So as you can imagine in this problem, the computational complexity of this problem would vary as you vary the signal to noise ratio. In particular, for a sufficiently low signal to noise ratio, you don't expect to be able to recover x at all. It should be statistically impossible to recover x. And for a sufficiently high value of signal to noise ratio, the problem should be computationally easy. What we are interested in is mapping out how the computational complexity of this problem changes as you change the signal to noise ratio. In particular, we'd like to know this curve. And there are already several interesting predictions of phase transitions uh, using techniques from statistical physics for various estimation problems that predict how this curve should look like. However, in order to make this, these predictions precise, 
we have to prove these theorems for computation complexity, which is a very difficult object to reason about. In particular, uh, it, it's it, unconditional lower bounds in computation complexity are really hard to come by. And the, all the mechanisms of reductions and uh, complexity classes work well in the worst case, and in the average case setting, they don't work as well. So, so one possible suggestion to circumvent this issue might be to use a proxy for computational complexity. And one possible pro proxy is the sum of squares degree. So this is a reasonable proposition because sum of squares as a technique, it subsumes several well-known and powerful algorithmic techniques like linear programming and spectral methods. Uh, it's conjectured to be optimal in the worst case settings, uh, and the unique games conjecture and so on. And typically, more in, for many problems, once you have a sum of squares lower bound, there are no other known algorithms for that problem. So sum of squares degree is a, seems like a very precisely defined tractable measure of computational complexity, which we could use as a proxy. And once we use this proxy, uh, we can actually start f figuring out the computational complexity of these problems. For instance, for the tensor PCA problem, uh, recent work has shown that the degree of sum of squares proof in increases as you in decrease the signal strength give, uh, as follows. The degree is basically up to polylogarithmic factors n squared divided by lambda squared. So this is really nice. In particular, it plots uh, the exact degree uh, as the signal strength varies. And this has also been carried out for you know, related problems like tensor PCA in any dimensions, random CSPs, uh, possibly even planted clique, uh, and so on. However, there's a long wish list of things which I wish this was, uh, we figured it out for. In particular, it would be nice to have a general theory that characterizes optimal algorithms and thresholds for inference problems. In particular, the goal would be to demonstrate these computational phase transitions that have been predicted, uh, formally demonstrate them. So there's a long list of problems like community detection, uh, properties of random graphs, or uh, just PCA, like sparse PCA, compressed sensing, mi mixture models for Gaussians, and so on. OK, so this is uh, uh, the prelude. And in the rest of the talk, what I'll do is I'll give you a glimpse of the upper and lower bound results for the tensor PCA, see what, show you what techniques are used there, and what are the future uh, work in that, those areas. So firstly, I'll show you the SOS degree upper bound for tensor PCA. So here, just to recall, the problem was given this four tensor, which is a signal plus noise, we want to recover the signal x, which is a unit vector. It's a natural way to recover x would be to maximize the degree four polynomial given by this four tensor t. Specifically, you maximize t of x equal to summation ijkl, tijkl, xi, xj, xk, xl. This is a natural approach to recover x, and you can prove that it does recover and a vector which is close to x uh, if the signal strength is strong enough. And uh, so a related question would be, you know, this is, uh, what is the value of this objective uh, that we're trying to maximize? So the it defines a norm, which is the injective tensor norm. The injective tensor norm of a four tensor is just the maximum of the corresponding degree four polynomial over the unit ball. Okay. Uh, and instead of talking about tensor PCA itself, it turns out to be cleaner to talk about a related problem and the results carry over. So here's the related problem. Here, the related problem is the problem of certifying a bound on the tensor norm. In particular, you're given a tensor which is purely Gaussian. It, it, there is no signal in it. And your goal is to certify that there is no signal in it. Alternately, you want to compute an upper bound on the injective tensor norm. You're given a random Gaussian tensor, and you want to compute the upper bound on the value of this uh, optimization problem, which is maximizing that polynomial or the unit sphere. Clearly, uh, you know, what you'd want is that the algorithm's upper bound is always correct, and the upper bound is as close to the true value as possible. 
This problem is not only related to tensor PC, but it also lies at the heart of uh, random refute the uh, lies at the heart of ref the problem of refuting random constraint satisfaction problems like random three sat. So let's uh, so so this will be our uh, goal for our upper bound. So just to make sure we want an upper bound for this degree four polynomial, which is given by the four tensor, which is a random Gaussian tensor. And what is the value? You know, if you take a typical random Gaussian tensor, you can prove that by a standard epsilon net argument that the injective tensor norm is at most square root n. However, uh, uh, more, all the efficient algorithms that we know can only certify an upper bound of order n. Okay, can only uh, prove an upper bound of order n. So, so let's see how we, one would come up with these upper bounds. So let's start with a spectral upper bound, very simple spectral upper bound. So you have a four tensor, which is a four dimensional array of numbers. You can flatten it out into a matrix of dimension n squared by n squared. Instead of a n by n by n by n four tensor, you have an n squared by n squared matrix, which still has the same numbers. I'll call this matrix A. And we're just rearranging these uh, polynomials. So the original polynomial T in a product X tensor four which is a degree four polynomial, can be written as a quadratic A evaluated on the vector x tensor x. And if x is a unit vector, x tensor x is also a unit vector. So the value of this quadratic is at most the spectral norm of this matrix A. And this matrix A, recall, is just a random mat matrix with IID Gaussian entries, which is n squared by n squared size. And so with high probability, the value of its spectral norm is at most order n. And you can compute this value, and it's an upper bound on the value of the tensor norm. However, note that our goal was to get a bound of around square root n, but we got to outer n. But this is a very simple algorithm. OK, so let's see how to improve this. So this, uh, oh, and, and an observation is this, this is a proof of an upper bound. And I, it's very easy to rewrite this proof as a degree four proof in the original variables, which are the x's, and degree four sum of squares proof. So this is captured by the degree four SOS relaxation. So the degree four SOS relaxation gives you a value of at most up order n on this. So let's see how to improve this. So one way to try to improve this is, uh, so we want to use the symmetry of the vector x tensor two. So in order to use the symmetry, what we'll do is, let's, let me just raise this inequal identity I have to the power k and raise the whole thing to the 1 over k. I didn't do anything. The injective tensor norm is whatever I was maximizing raised to the power k, the whole thing raised to the 1 over k. So this, uh, you know, I, we can rewrite it as a, a quadratic form on x tensor 2k, which is again a unit vector. So now I can do the same trick and I get that this is at most the spectral norm of a tensor k whole to the 1 over k. And, but unfortunately, this turns out to be just a spectral norm of A because the spectral norm tensorizes. So we didn't get any better bound by doing this. However, the next thing we observe is these vectors that we are computing this quadratic form over, the vector x tensor 2k, is a vector that has a lot of symmetries. In particular, it is symmetric under permutation of its dimensions, uh, the 2k dimensions. So we so the value of this polynomial would not change if I average the matrix A tensor K on, on these permutations. So I'll replace A tensor K by M K, which is basically look at this matrix A tensor K and average the rows and columns on permutations of the one to two K and write down that averaged matrix that is M tensor K, M K. Okay, so now this is again a valid upper bound. And now we'll do the same thing. We'll say, oh, the value is upper bound by the spectral norm of mk instead of a tensor k. Okay. So if one can show that this upper bound is actually captured by a degree 4k sum of squares proof. So, so how good is this upper bound? Actually, this upper bound is pretty good. It actually gives you the SOS upper, upper bound result that I was claiming. In particular, one can show that the spectral norm of this matrix MK is n over root K. And the reason one should expect this is the matrix MK is a random matrix, clearly. It depends on the original thing. And if you compute the variance of each entry, 
The variance of each entry is 1 over k factorial, because you averaged over k factorial permutations. And therefore, somehow, you'd expect to get a 1 over k factorial in the spectral norm. However, making this precise a little bit tricky, because the entries of the matrix are not independent, they are polynomials in the original Gaussian entries of the tensor. For instance, if you set k equal to 2, you have an n to the 4 by n to the 4 matrix whose entries look like this. They look like degree 2 polynomials in the original tensor. And if you look at mk, the entries are degree k polynomials in the original tensor t. So proving this upper bound of the spectral norm, you need to go through the trace method by carefully, and but it's, uh, it's doable. So, so that's the upper bound for the uh, SOS. But if you're, uh, some of you might notice that why would you need to use SOS at all? Why not do the following simpler algorithm, right? Because what you could do is you have the original tensor T. You have the, you, why don't we just compute the matrix MK whose entries are polynomials in the uh, entries of the original tensor. So you compute the matrix MK. Compute its spectral norm. You can do it by computing the largest eigenvalue. And just output that as your upper bound. So we don't need to solve an SDP. You just compute one, uh, I, one computation of spectral norm. And so this is nice. It's, in fact, a simpler, faster algorithm. And, uh, but surprisingly, this phenomenon is actually not very isolated. It, it's a fairly broad phenomenon in that uh, for many problems which satisfy a certain very mild property called the robust inference property. I won't try to define it here. Uh, we, one can show that the SOS, if the SOS algorithm succeeds, then there's a simpler spectral algorithm that succeeds. And the spectral algorithm just computes a large matrix with whose entries are polynomials in your input and computes the largest positive eigenvalue of that. Um, of course, this is for a slightly weaker task of not recovery, but uh, just to find the um, find out if there's a signal or not. Yeah. Okay. So this was all I wanted to say about SOS upper bound. Uh, now I'll talk a little bit about SOS lower bound. And so in order to talk about SOS lower bound, let me just say what the schema is. So, so what what we have is this tensor which has a signal plus noise. And suppose uh, degree D SOS succeeds on this, as in it recovers x successfully. What it means is the following. There is a convex optimization problem which we didn't define in the talk, which is the degree D SOS SDP relaxation. It's a convex optimization problem. And if you solve that problem, the solution yields x. In particular, the, to say that degree D SOS recovers x is to say the following, that the, the, this associated convex optimization problem is feasible, and x is essentially the only solution, meaning most solutions are close to x in a formal way. So in, if, there, if we look at a, another distribution where there is no signal, if I give you a tensor where there's no x, no signal to find, then it should be the case that this convex optimization problem is infeasible. So it's feasible when there is a signal, and it's infeasible on the other hand. And the way you would prove a lower bound is to contradict the second statement. In particular, the strategy would be, we'll forget about the planted distribution. We just prove that when, even when there is no signal in the null distribution, you, there is the convex of convex problem has feasible solutions. Or the strategy is just to exhibit a feasible solution to the convex optimization problem under the null distribution. That's the goal. And this is a strategy that's been followed quite a bit. And uh, by constructing these feasible solutions by hand, it's pretty difficult to generalize this. But it's been successfully done for random CSPs or planted clique. And in each time, you have to construct these solutions by hand. It's quite technical. And uh, it's harder to get optimal lower bounds this way. So this was the state of the affairs or the strategy for quite a f f uh, f until uh, very recently, where a line of work uh, on planted clique problem culminated with this uh, beautiful work, which introduced this technique of pseudo calibration. It's a very gen one 
succinct way to say it, it's a candidate way, candidate construction of these feasible solutions for the null distribution. So going back, we have this null distribution where there's no signal, and we still want to construct feasible solutions. And the key insight of pseudo-calibration is that we shouldn't forget the planted distribution. So we have a planted distribution over there. And in the planted distribution, this convex optimization problem is feasible. So in fact, the signal x itself is a solution that always exists for this thing. And the idea is to transfer solutions, meaning transfer this feasible solution from the planted distribution to the null distribution. And how would you do the transfer? Well, uh, look at the function f, which takes the tensor and recovers the signal x. It's some function of the tensor. So I, I'm just saying the uh, 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 you, Basically, the conditional expectation of the signal given the, fu given the tensor. That's the function. Basically, f is a function that takes the tensor, which in, from the planted distribution outputs the signal. It's a function of the tensor. Project this function onto the low degree polynomials in the tensor T. So basically, approximate this function by a low degree polynomial. And now, you just evaluate it under the null distribution evaluate this low degree polynomial in the null distribution. And the claim is this gives you a candidate SOS SDP solution. So this is a little bit should be surprising at first because uh, what, what it is saying is the following. We want to find solutions to this semi-definite program or linear program on random tensors. And what it is saying is it's giving you a candidate solution, which is actually a low degree polynomial in the original problem. Typically, solving an SDP or an LP, you solve a complicated convex optimization routine, which is an algorithm which out spits out a solution. It's almost never the case that the solution itself is just some evaluation of a polynomial on the constraints, on the coefficients in the linear or the semi-definite program. What this is saying is take the coefficients in the linear semi-definite program, sm smash it through this low degree polynomial, the output is a solution to the SDP. So it's a bit surprising, but it's, surprisingly it works. And in, in some cases. And the key advantage is it's very general. It's very easy to uh, write down what the solution should be. And it recovers many existing constructions in a unified way. The, the main disadvantage is this is construction is still very conjectural. In particular, it, it's, it's been proven to work for planted clique and tensor PCA by proofs that are quite technical and very hairy and difficult to generalize. However, you know, if this is a valid construction of an SOS SDP solution, um, then it, it implies a very bold conjecture, which is that for broad families of estimation problems, if the low degree SOS SDP distinguishes between two distributions, then a slightly higher degree polynomials distinguish between them. So in particular, we started out this, with this goal of understanding this fairly complicated algorithm, which is the SOS semi-definite program. It's, this said, suggests that you just have to understand how polynomials behave on the original pair of distributions, which is a much easier task. And, um, and uh, uh, this still remains a conjecture right now. Um, but if you... The, the predictions that, that you, you can make, you immediately make, start making predictions based on this conjecture. And uh, it's interesting that these predictions coincide with the conjectured and proven thresholds for community detection and related models. Uh, and these, these thresholds were predicted and proved, predicted using techniques from statistical physics and proved, um, um, uh, proved fairly recently. And uh, it's surprising that if you, if you start with this conjecture, you get the same predictions. So it's possible that this conjecture is true, and it will be really nice to understand why if it is. Um, so it's a very uh, interesting uh, time to be working in this area. Some of squares algorithms actually open an avenue to have a general theory on these average case statistical estimation problems. And uh, it's likely that this pseudo calibration technique can be used to actually provably demonstrate phase transitions, very sharp phase transitions in these computational problems. Um, I'll stop here.
Thank you very much for providing this insight into sums of squares and uh, estimation properties. Are there questions? We have a little time for questions. I'm Tristram Bogart from Los Andes University in Colombia. And uh, my question is more of the first part of the talk. When you guys were talking about low degree polynomials, does that mean like low is in constant or growing slowly with n? Uh, I, I, I think in the applications that uh, David mentioned, the, it was uh, a constant and the bounding, and, and you would get polynomial time algorithms as soon as you make the, uh, you, you'd get the optimal uh, result as soon as you make the degree up to log n. But for every constant, you would get better and better algorithms for that. So typically, in all of these uh, problems, uh, we would want a low degree as in constant degree uh, proof, because uh, the runtime for, for running the degree d sum of squares SDP is n to the d. So the degree of the polynomial goes in the exponent of the runtime. So we would really want a constant. Is there another question? Uh, is this, uh, so I'm uh, Gil Kalei, uh, is this related to efficient uh, learning of uh, such mixture of uh, Gaussians and uh, uh, related distribution or noisy distribution? Uh, y y yes. Uh, uh, I, uh, so the algorithm that David described actually gives you an algorithm to learn Gaussians, mixtures of Gaussians. Uh, and... Uh, um, the, uh, but the, yeah, so, so now, so there's several problems for an unsupervised learning for which SOSSDP has been used to, uh, devise algorithms recently, but, uh, the precise, uh, learning, con precise connection between learning has, hasn't yet made it into the proofs of lower bounds and so on. More questions? If there is no further question, let's thank the speakers again.